What's the deal with anuses? Is it true that at one point in our development, we were all nothing more than an anus? What exactly is it even for? What's it made of? And how is this all connected to an unexploded World War I artillery shell? Well, hold on to your butts, because we're about to answer all these burning questions and more. Hey, you in the back, stop giggling, this is a serious scientific video. The word anus is actually derived from Latin and translates to ring or circle in English. We've all got one and, let's be honest here, we all know what they're for. The anus, well, for humans and most animals alike, plays a vital role in our digestive systems as well as, well, let's just say what comes after for now. Despite everyone on the planet owning one, talking about the anus and its functions can often be considered something of a taboo and even a disgusting topic to some. That can lead to some of us even feeling shame or disgust at ourselves if we develop certain disorders or conditions that affect the anus, which in turn can cause it to become a difficult topic to broach when seeking medical assistance for those problems. Just like developing our understanding of any other part of our bodies, getting to grips with the anus can allow us to better appreciate its significance and eliminate any misconceptions we might have. As somebody who owns an anus, you might already know the primary bodily function of the anus is to regulate the exit of feces from the body. In order to do this, an anus is located at the end of the rectum. Hold on a moment, aren't those the same thing? Well, while you might have heard them used interchangeably, either as insults or for some highbrow jokes, the anus and the rectum are actually two distinct parts of the digestive system. Speaking of which, let's take a look at the whole process to get an idea of exactly how the anus functions as part of this important bodily function. You see, as many of you are already aware, your digestive system has both a small and a large intestine. These are the two large tubes that perform a process known as peristalsis. This is the name given to the movement of the inner walls of those hollow internal organs. Both the small and the large intestines contain a layer of muscle in order to move food and liquid through your gastrointestinal tract. As the muscle behind all the food you consume contracts, it squeezes all that food forward, while the portion of the muscle in front relaxes, allowing everything you've eaten and drank to pass through it. Once you've eaten or drank something, you might not give much thought to where it goes once it's no longer in your mouth. But from there, it travels down your esophagus, which also performs this process of peristalsis. The reason you've never noticed is because it's completely automatic. Your brain sends electrical signals through your body to the relevant parts involved in specific biological and physiological processes, meaning it all takes place without you ever having to think about it. That's also how food passes from your esophagus through your lower esophageal sphincter, a ring of muscle that's essentially the door to your stomach, designed to let in what you eat, while also preventing your potentially harmful stomach acid from getting out. Your stomach, as you probably know, is responsible for mixing your eaten foods with acids that break it down as part of the digestive process. These resultant contents are known as chyme, and that's what then gets passed through your small intestine. There, the muscles of your small intestine add further digestive juices from certain organs like your pancreas and your liver. They'll also extract and absorb water and nutrients from your food and add those to your bloodstream. Next, the leftover waste products are moved into your large intestine as the process of peristalsis continues. Any of the waste going through the large intestine, normally consisting of undigested food, excess fluid, and even your old cells from the lining of your gastrointestinal tract, changes into, well, the end result. That waste continues from your intestines to your colon, which is made of much the same stuff, namely layers of muscle and tissue with glands that can absorb and secrete different substances. After going through the length of the colon, food waste then heads to the rectum, and now you're going to find out the difference. You see, the rectum is located at the lower end of your large intestines, which are long continuous tubes that also include your colon and the anus. Your rectum is where the food that's been reduced to solid waste is stored. Once it arrives, the rectum stores the waste and absorbs any remaining water until the time comes to release it. Think of it as the last stop right at the end of the line before the train that leaves and heads off toward its shed. It's a journey that starts when your food enters your mouth and terminates when it gets to the last six inches or so of your large intestine. Once it arrives there, it just has to wait for one last signal before it's able to make its final departure. Your rectum is connected to an anal canal, where your food makes its eventual exit from your body. As the remaining waste passes from your colon and then into your rectum, it collects there until your nerve endings trigger your urge to… well, there's no nice way to say this, but your urge to poop. 
When that waste matter moves into the rectum, nerve receptors located there will send signals to your brain, alerting you that you need to evacuate the waste, or if it's just gas. If it's the latter, then your brain knows it's safe to expel it without issue. Well, that's not always a basket of roses for whoever happens to be sitting next to you. If it's time to get rid of the waste, those same nerves will let you know to get moving to the nearest bathroom. Similarly, the anus has a high concentration of nerve endings, making it a highly sensitive area of the body. This sensitivity can vary from person to person, but typically the anal canal continues on from your rectum, making up the last few centimeters of the large intestine. The anus consists of a ring of muscle and actually has several other important muscles that aid in its function. The anal canal is surrounded by these ring-like muscles that are called sphincters that are designed to control your bowel movements. Both of those, the external and internal sphincters, are located at the anus. The external one is voluntary, meaning it can be contracted or relaxed at will, while the internal sphincter does so involuntarily. The canal is also lined with a mucous membrane, a thin layer of moist tissue containing glands that produce mucus, a slippery fluid that can help that waste make its dramatic exit, and from there, well, you don't need us to tell you what happens. Let's instead talk about some other things that you might not know about the anus. The anus is actually part of your body's most powerful group of muscles, along with the gluteus maximus, the gluteus medius, and the gluteus minimus. Much like other muscles in the body, the anus possesses a degree of elasticity, meaning it can stretch and then return to its original state. This allows our muscles to carry out their specific function, and the anus is no exception. That also means, again, just like the other muscles, the more you exercise it, the stronger it can get. Pilates is actually a great way to strengthen your pelvic floor muscles, which the anus is connected to. Now, as we mentioned before, largely given the role it plays in our digestion, the anus is socially considered to be a taboo part of the body. As a result, you might often hear some people refer to it using slang terminology. There are well over 50 different colloquial terms for the anus, many of which are considered to be so vulgar that they're actually considered curse words, which means that we can't cite a lot of them as examples for this video. We're already on thin ice as it is right now. Some of the slightly more esoteric ones are phrases like ring piece and starfish. We'll stop with those two before we get ourselves demonetized. Depending on the context, some of those slang terms can be considered positive, negative, or even downright nasty and vitriolic. While to some it's often considered to be something of a funny body part, hence the use of profane slang to refer to it, it's also an incredibly important part of our anatomy and shouldn't be joked about in a scientific context. Speaking of how important the anus is, did you know that without one, you could possibly die? If not, you would certainly live in a lot of discomfort. You might have heard that the anus is normally one of the first parts of the body to develop when humans begin as embryos in the womb, meaning that at some point everyone was just an asshole. Jokes aside, that's not strictly true. Humans are similar to an evolutionary branch of animals known as deuterostomes. The defining characteristic of deuterostomes is that their anus does form before their mouth while they're an embryo. This can be found in a number of creatures in the animal kingdom, including any vertebrates, animals with a spinal column, and in particular starfish, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers. In the case of sea cucumbers, their anus isn't just an exit for digestive waste, it's also a mouth used for eating algae, and a defensive weapon that can launch a stringy web of internal organs at underwater predators, and its main way of breathing. Sea cucumbers are considered to be just a multi-function Swiss Army knife style anus that just happens to have a body around it. On the other hand, human beings evolved in such a way that we no longer follow the same pattern of deuterostomes. In human embryos, the mouth forms first during the fourth week of development. Four weeks later, this is then followed by the anus and the two are connected by a gut tube that would have already formed between them. However, sometimes human babies can in fact be born without an anus as a result of a birth defect, known as an imperforate anus. This affects one in around every 5,000 newborn babies and can occur alongside other abnormalities that affect the rectum and the anus. While we don't exactly know what causes an imperforate anus, it can manifest in a number of alarming ways. Some imperforate anuses result in a complete absence of an anal opening, while others cause the formation of an anus but in the wrong place on the body, usually a lot smaller than it needs to be. In some instances, something called a cloaca develops, which is when the anus, urethra, and other openings are all combined into a singular one. Naturally, this can lead to a whole host of problems for a newborn, 
with the most worrying one being that without an anus, an infant can't expel their waste, which if you or anyone you know has kids, you'll know it happens a lot. This alongside possible infections as a result of the birth defect can lead to early health complications and even death if the newborn isn't treated ASAP. This is a good time to mention the waste expelling process and how we learn about it. During our earliest stages of life, our brains haven't learned how to properly control our digestive and excretory systems yet. For older children and adults, this is like second nature. We know when our bodies are telling us we need to go, and we can even control the muscles of the anus to stop ourselves if we aren't able to get to a bathroom quickly. For infants and even some adults who develop certain neurological or muscular disorders as they grow older, that level of control just isn't possible. This is a big problem for someone born with an imperforate anus, as their large intestine doesn't end with an opening, it essentially just becomes a pouch. This can cause the waste to collect internally within the large intestine. If it stays there, it can cause vomiting or even make the abdomen swell up. The only way to treat an imperforate anus is with urgent surgery, which will create a new opening for the waste to pass through. While this surgery can differ, it typically involves three stages. The first is a procedure called a colostomy, where a stoma needs to be created. This is an external opening that brings the intestine out from under the skin. Waste is passed through the stoma into a bag that has to be worn outside the body. Yes, we know how unpleasant that sounds, but try to remember, it has to be even more uncomfortable for those unfortunate enough to have to live with one. The second part of the surgical process is called an anoplasty. This involves creating a new opening, a new anus in the usual place, and pulling the rectum down to meet it. If someone with an imperforate anus also has a fistula, a connection between the intestine and the bladder or the urethra, then that also needs to be closed off. Then after several months, once the new anus has healed, a third procedure is performed to close the stoma. While this is normally done while the person is still a baby in order for their body to adjust and for the digestive system to begin functioning properly as soon as possible, that doesn't always happen. One man in China had to go a whole 55 years without an anus in the proper place. A farmer from Hubei province named Wu was unable to afford the necessary operation until he reached his later years, which means that for half a century he had to make do with a small surgical hole around half a centimeter in diameter. He only had a stoma, part of the colostomy that makes up the initial surgical fix for an imperfect anus. Wu also had to squeeze waste out by hand, which of course sounds like a horrific and messy way to use the bathroom. He had to pay close attention to exactly what foods he ate in order to avoid constipation and use laxatives to evacuate his bowels thoroughly. In something of a happy ending though, not only did his condition not prevent Wu from getting married and having children, but he also did undergo surgery to fix the defect after five decades without proper treatment. As the anus is an orifice that leads directly into your body, naturally it makes it a site for a potential infection. There are a number of diseases that can potentially affect this part of your body, including anal cancer, anal fissures, which is where the lining of the anus tears, anal warts or abscesses, sexually transmitted infections, and hemorrhoids, dilated, twisted blood vessels in the walls of the anus or rectum. Given just how easy it can be to develop illnesses and infections like these, it's important to practice good hygiene when it comes to the anus. Cleaning it should be done with care, either by wiping the exterior or rinsing it with water. Occasionally, some people decide to remove the naturally occurring hair that develops around the anus during puberty. Brazilian waxing, trimming, or even shaving are all ways to do this, as well as bleaching that can lighten the darker look of the anus. Speaking of showing your anus some appreciation, it often has an essential role in sexuality. For many consenting adults of varying gender identities and sexual orientations, sexual activity that involves stimulating the anus is considered an enjoyable experience. For some, the anus is actually an erogenous zone, the areas of the body most affected by enjoyable sensations. Not everyone's erogenous zones are the same, but the anus is among one of the most common. But be careful what you do down there because according to a study conducted by some scientists in New York, a staggering 4,000 Americans are taken to the hospital every year with objects lodged up their anus and stuck in their rectum. This isn't exclusively related to sexuality either, with objects ranging from marbles and bottles to stationery and even drugs. Some examples include a shampoo bottle, chicken bones, an oven mitt, a light bulb, and a water balloon. The analysis these scientists carried out 
revealed that almost 40,000 people were admitted to the hospital emergency departments for injuries like this between the years 2012 and 2021. In 8 out of 10 cases, the patients were men, with those in their 20s and early 30s making up a third of all those visits to the emergency room. But we know you want to hear about the craziest stories like this. Well, in 2022, an elderly man was admitted to the hospital with an undetonated World War I bomb lodged up his anus and in his rectum. No, really, we're not making this up. The man was 88 at the time when he was admitted to the Hospital saint Meuse in Toulon, southern France, with an 8-inch artillery shell that had found an unlikely target. It even triggered a bomb scare at the hospital, but luckily, bomb disposal experts were able to determine that the shell was unlikely to explode while it was still lodged inside the man. Fortunately for him, the doctors were able to remove the bomb from its confinement without any explosive incident occurring. After all, we've said thus far that you might think the anus is an inherently dirty or germ-ridden part of the body, but it is very much worth remembering that as long as you maintain a good standard of hygiene, then that simply won't be the case. In fact, it's worth remembering that there are actually more germs and bacteria present in your mouth than in your anus. No, really, it's actually a misconception that the types of harmful bacteria that can cause diseases are found in supposedly dirtier places of the body. For one, not all bacteria feed on waste matter, then for another, thanks to all the food that we intake, which could be carrying innocuous bacteria and airborne bacteria breathed in through the mouth, we actually do have more bacteria in our mouths than our anuses. Before you panic, that's not always a bad thing either. Oral bacteria also perform a lot of important functions, and most of the bacteria that enter your gut and reach the anus, harmful or otherwise, only get there because they enter through your mouth. Now watch Weird Facts About Testicles, or check out Weird Facts About the Male Body.